Hello everyone, welcome back to Dragonfly Engineering. My name is David Eberhardt and this week we've got a special project where we're actually collaborating with uh, Keith Rucker uh, who has his own uh, YouTube channel at uh, vintagemachinery.org and he's partnered with um, Nashville Steam Preservation Society uh, and these, uh, these folks have a, uh, a uh, mainline steam engine that they're restoring, steam engine number 576. So he collaborated with, with that organization to uh, completely restore a Stoker steam engine. Uh, so you should check out his, uh, his YouTube channel. Uh, I think he's got, actually got a uh, series just on the Stoker steam engine. Uh, and in that series, uh, you can see this, uh, how this Stoker steam engine is used to power a uh, screw auger and the coal tender behind the uh, locomotive itself and uh, the screw auger feeds coal into the uh, into the firebox of the into the boiler the, or the firebox in the boiler of the locomotive uh, because this this locomotive was so big and powerful that a human couldn't shovel coal fast enough to keep it going so this um, probably several hundred horsepower steam engine which is uh, considered an accessory in the in the uh, coal tender uh, loads coal continually as as the the locomotive uh, goes down the line so Keith uh, has uh, requested uh, with a couple of YouTubers uh, to help with some of the parts and he asked me if I could help uh, remake the, uh, the piston rods uh, and the castle nut that connects the piston rod to the two pistons inside of the Stoker engine. Uh, so let's zoom in on these parts and I can talk a little more detail about it. Okay, so here's an up close view of uh, one of the uh, two piston rods and one of the two castle nuts that we need to, uh, to make. Uh, so today we're going to um, remachine this castle nut out of A2 uh, tool steel. You can see A2. I had some extra, so I measured it out to see if it would fit. Um, I'd consider Keith and I talked about just buying a uh, one and one eighth by seven threads per inch uh, castle nut, uh, which Granger sells. But uh, we decided to go ahead and recreate the exact uh, nuts and parts that were originally made in 1941, I believe, is the manufacture date of this uh, steam engine here. So that, um, for one thing, the, uh, the standards of castle nuts today are a little different. The, the slot here where the, where the cotter pin goes through uh, is not as deep as these. So uh, this end of the, oh, and Keith had to cut this uh, piston rod up into three pieces to get it out of the, uh, out of the Stoker steam engine. Uh, that's why we've got three pieces here. So this, um, this taper here actually goes into the uh, wedges in. It's like a Morris taper. It's a three quarters of an inch per 12 inch taper on this, uh, the end of this piston rod. And this taper fits into the, uh, into the piston itself, the steam engine piston. And then on the other end, the actual high pressure steam side inside of the, of the cylinder uh, is where the castle nut screws on. And you see that little hole right there? that hole is where a cotter pin goes through. So a castle nut's purpose is to not back out uh, under any circumstances. So what you do is you screw this castle nut on, tighten down the, uh, the piston in the, in the uh, steam engine, and then wherever it tightens down, or basically you got to tighten the castle nut to the point where uh, you have uh, clear access uh, through, let's see if you can see, yeah, through the castle nut and through the uh, through the rod, uh, and then you put a cotter pin through all of that. But we're going to do this uh, this piston rod uh, in a uh, in the next episode. And today we're going to focus on uh, making new castle nuts. Uh, and to uh, make this castle nut, I've, I found a piece of this A2 uh, tool steel. I chose the A2 because uh, on one of Keith's previous episodes, he actually showed how he could with his uh, heat treating oven. Actually, he's got a process to heat treat A2 steel. And A2 means quenches in air, so you don't have to dip it in oil or anything. Uh, and I measured it out, and I, I can see that I can get two nuts off of this piece of stock. Uh, we're going to use half-inch carbide end mills. So this is a roughing end mill. All these little teeth on here actually kind of plow through the steel relatively easily, and it makes uh, thousands of little chips. So the forces on, on a roughing end mill, let me zoom on it are a lot lower because each tooth here kind of chips off a little bit of steel at a time. 
And then to have a good finish uh, on our on our castle nut, we're going to finish off with a regular carbide three fluid end mill. Uh, that's because I have this in stock, and it its flute clearance is uh, enough to clear the depth of the nut. So we're going to CNC machine uh, these two uh, castle nuts in this A2 material. But I don't have a whole lot of height on this stock, uh, so I went ahead and uh, switched up to the Herco mill because over here we've got some uh, dovetails already machined into this aluminum soft jaw. So with uh, cutting dovetails on the bottom of this stock, uh, we don't have to have much uh, engagement on the vice jaws to hold this stock in place because it's undercut by some uh, dovetails. So let me load this guy upside down and we'll cut some uh, dovetails uh, in this stock that matches the uh, soft jaw over there. So this is our dovetail tool. It's actually a router bit for wood. <laughs> we'll go uh, real close to the shank to help with its strength. And this is a ER16 collet holder. All right, so the exact geometry of this uh, dovetail isn't too critical. Uh, the main thing of interest is that the both dovetails uh, are the same height relative to the back side of the stock. So we're looking at the back of the stock right now. So there's the uh, dovetail that we just machined, uh, one on each side. Uh, the uh, router bit was not happy. <laughs> All right, I've imported the 3D model of the uh, one and one eighth by uh, seven threads per inch castle nut here. Order of operations here is center drill. Uh, the, we're gonna drill out the center of the nut and also a pilot hole for the uh, half inch end mills, uh, you know, cause you don't really wanna plunge an end mill into hard steel or tool steel. Uh, next operation is going to be a, this uh, quarter inch drill bit, uh, which um, will drill the center and then the pilot for our um, end mill plunge over to the right, followed by the uh, three quarter inch drill, which will drill out the, the bulk of the center of the nut. Then after that is the uh, half inch roughing end mill. And you can see over here where we did our um, pilot hole. This is where the end mill is going to plunge down. Uh, we can do an animation here. Oh, actually, well, we're, we're going to machine the center of the, uh, of the nut first to bring the uh, ID of the thread to spec. And then the uh, half inch end mill will plunge down into that pilot hole and then go around and machine the profile of the nut and then dropping down half the tool diameter every time. Uh, next operation is going to be the uh, quarter inch four fluid end mill to cut out our castle nut slots here. You can see how it's just going to go around there and then basically goes around. I did a rotary or a radial pattern. Then uh, we're going to do a f uh, finish cut uh, because there is a taper on the top of the nut here. So if we zoom in, you can see that we're going to profile the uh, this little notch here or this uh, corner break. Uh, not a notch, uh, but here's the, so it's gonna be a raster cut. And then the final operation is gonna be thread milling. And we're going to use a single single point thread mill and uh, machine our cut as opposed to using a tap or something. Uh, I'm gonna use a, a thread milling tool and, and the mill will do a helical cut uh, from the bottom up and match the, um, the thread of the uh, one and one eighth uh, dash seven thread. And I, I had to do four passes uh, because one, it's an expensive tool and, I, and there's no need to go fast on it. And um, we're probably gonna have to touch up this thread anyway. So let's go ahead and load the stock and uh, load this program. It's really just the locking in of the V groove that we're interested in. Oh, see, there it came out. Okay, so right now the V groove is sitting on the uh, or the dovetail cut is sitting, or is nested into the dovetail on the aluminum. Uh, so let's go ahead and tighten this. You don't really have to even hammer it in because the uh, dovetails will self-lock. So this is a close-up view of the single point thread cutter. And basically there's a single plane of teeth that, um, that helix around and cut the threads, uh, internal threads into our, into our castle nut here. All right, so here's our collection of tools. Uh, this is the center drill, uh, which will set all the spots for the drills. Uh, this is a quarter inch drill, which is gonna be the pilot hole for um, both the uh, three quarter inch drill, as well as the, uh, the two uh, half inch end mills. Uh, three quarter inch drill to drill out the center of the uh, nut. 
uh, roughing uh, end mill uh, with the uh, kind of the knurled teeth on there. Uh, these, these will uh, chip away at the material and it's a real efficient cutting scheme. Uh, and then our finishing end mill is uh, just a smooth flute, three flute. Uh, and then a quarter inch um, uh, four flute end mill for cutting the castle uh, 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 notches. And then here is the, uh, the threading end mill that uh, we already looked at a little bit. So, all right, let's load these up. I'm gonna set the tool heights and the zero location for the first uh, nut uh, machine. We double check that we have the right program loaded. And then we are going to go to auto mode. And very important, you wanna reduce the feed rate and you wanna reduce the rapid rate down to uh, very slow. And spindle speed, you wanna have it at your ideal. Uh, and this is all to help prevent crashes. Uh, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, uh, hit the cycle start and be ready to stop the program with motion hold or emergency stop. So I'm gonna hit cycle start and the program has started and my finger was uh, ready to stop on the motion. But I'm gonna go ahead and uh, pause the program here so you can see the action in the, in the mill itself. And you can see how I've got the rapid really slow. If I speed up the rapid, then you can see how things can get out of hand. So we're just gonna take it nice and easy and do our first drill peck. I'm also watching the, uh, the DRO, the digital readout on the uh, mill controller to make sure everything is looking correct. Now we're gonna do our drill. And I'm spraying, I don't wanna get the, the camera too uh, covered in coolant. <laughs> and again, we're gonna go slow here because this is uh, trying out a new program and see how it pounced down to the stock. And uh, this looks good. Another thing we can do is interrupt the cut. Here, I got a, these are steel chips, so they may cut my finger. <laughs> and then I'll hit auto again, and then the start button, and it'll go back to uh, wherever it was in the program. All right, that's good. So this is a three quarter inch drill. Um, and obviously uh, I've reduced its RPM because this is probably gonna be a pretty nasty heavy cut. Getting some chatter. Uh, the spindle's running at about, oh, there it started cutting better. Spindle was running about 40% of load, which is uh, maybe about 10 horsepower. I think the chatter you heard was the tip of the drill bit engaging uh, into the top of the stock. Once the sides of the drill are referencing its hole, then the chatter went away. But we're still up there around 50% horsepower. Oh, but we're done. That wasn't so bad. <laughs> so this is the roughing end mill. I still got everything kind of slowed down from that big drill. So now we're gonna plunge straight down in the quarter inch uh, pilot hole. And get rid of that ring. I reduced the RPM down to 1300 and a feed rate of uh, about three inches per minute. I'm gonna get some more flood in there. So that sounds healthy. 
Let's go ahead and enter up so we can see what's going on. All right, so uh, yeah, let me get the GoPro. So this is what's going on with our cut. Uh, I've already uh, machined the, uh, the minor diameter of our threaded um, hole there in the middle of the nut. And here is the pilot hole to plunge the, uh, the half inch roughing end mill. You can see all these little teeth on the sides of the flutes. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're cutting pretty good so far. Uh, let's <laughs> knock on wood. Uh, so let's go ahead and keep cutting. All right, so I can go ahead and uh, continue the program by just hitting auto, and we're gonna have to wrap it up at, uh, at, at uh, 50% of full, just so you get an idea of why you should have your rapids uh, low or as close to zero as possible when you start a program. Because you, you don't have time to react if uh, your rapid velocity is uh, anywhere close to the capability of uh, most of these CNC machines. Which means uh, if you screwed something up, then you busted your tool and maybe damaged your mill. <laughs> and that was 50% rapid. Uh, when you uh, come off of an interrupt uh, in a program, uh, the, the mill knows how to uh, decelerate its z-axis so that it, it doesn't overshoot. Uh, so the last like um, eighth of an inch, it decelerates itself down to cutting speed, basically, and then enters the cut. I'm going to go ahead and pause to make sure this tool's set right and zoom in again. Actually, let's uh, turn off the coolant so you can see where we're at. So that is the uh, rough shape of our castle nut. <laughs> okay, this is a finished cut, so we'll leave the coolant off for a second. Uh, so I'm releasing motion hold. Coming in nice and easy. You never know what could be wrong with your program. All right, that looks good. And I'm going to turn the coolant off and just make sure that we enter this next cut correctly with the right tool offset. Okay, now that I got the, uh, the microphone on, <laughs> we started our first cut and we are spiraling up uh, out of the cut right now. Uh, so everything sounds good. So this is cutting our uh, seven threads per inch uh, helical uh, thread. So after we finish this cut, I'm going to try out the, uh, the actual uh, shaft or the mating thread. And it's almost certainly going to be too tight because I didn't add any thread slop into this uh, profile yet. That'll be the next step is we'll start um, encroaching on the, uh, on the ideal thread size uh, to create the clearance. Usually it's like a 2A or a 2B uh, clearance on typical threads. Now that's just so you can screw the thread in without it jamming up and basically cold welding. 
They were starting to hit the interrupted cut from the uh, castle wall. Uh, this uh, little flap here is, uh, I'll have to clean that up with a uh, chamfering operation. Uh, so a, a 45 degree chamfer end mill will go and uh, clean up that top edge because, uh, you know, the, the thread will go to an infinitely thin piece of uh, sheet metal basically, which is that guy right there. So let's get the uh, uh, Keith's cut off uh, piston rod that he pulled out of the steam engine and, and we'll see what our fit looks like. We'll find the uh, start of the thread, which is right here, and then the start of our uh, CNC thread is here. So let me uh, screw this guy in and see what we get. Now the thread did engage, uh, but as I can, as I would, as I assumed, it's uh, tight, and then it kind of just bottoms out. So this is pretty typical uh, when both threads are cut to true size. There's no room for uh, clearance, so they basically just jam up and stop. Uh, so the next step is uh, basically to post out this, this single operation uh, as a new program. And then on the mill, I'm going to raise the tool up. I'm going to do a tool offset just with the mill uh, offset, uh, tooling offsets. Uh, we can double check it. Uh, so here is a bunch of uh, helical spiral data, uh, which is going to define our uh, outer cut on our um, on our helical uh, thread cut, uh, so we can exit that. Uh, now the next thing I want to do is uh, offset the tool, uh, so we can go to um, manual tool management, tool setup. So I think, uh, and we're in inches, so. I'm thinking that we're going to, uh, I'm going to bring the tool down to the zero that I said originally. I think we'll go up, let's do five thousandths, even though that says four nine, let's make that five thousandths. Uh, set tool length, there we go. Our new tool uh, went to uh, zero again, so now our tool is five thousandths higher than it was before. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and run this. Actually before we run it, I always like to raise the tool up out of the part. And everything looks good so far. I'll increase the rapid a little bit. Uh, okay, that looks good. Now I'm going to increase the uh, feed so we can feed down into our helix and do a five thousandths offset helical cut on this on this uh, seven pitch thread. No, that feels good. It's pretty tight. Uh, there is there is a little bit of rust on uh, the old shaft here, and we are starting to tighten up a little bit. Yeah, so the question is, do we increase the height of the uh, thread, or are we bottoming out on the tips of the thread? Um, this tool has infinitely sharp tips on it. 
Yeah, so with that 5,000th change in height uh, to widen the, uh, you know, the thread profile in our nut, uh, we almost are on it. So one thing about uh, doing the CNC thread milling is you don't, uh, you don't have a tap to chase out your threads after you're done. So you kind of have to get your thread handled uh, while it's fixtured on your mill. So I was able to tighten the, uh, the old um, piston rod down, I think all the way. What I did is I, med I marked the thread on the uh, piston rod. I think what I'll do is I'll look at the uh, piston rod under a microscope and see if the threads are starting to underdevelop. All right, well, I'm looking at the, uh, under this uh, little uh, digital microscope here, I'm looking at the, the, um, the face where I marked the threads on the, uh, on the piston rod where we kind of bottomed out in the machined nut. And it looks as if there's some uh, shiny tips to the threads here. Uh, so this is my green Sharpie mark, and this is more green Sharpie mark. But you can see how the tips of the threads are kind of burnished uh, clean steel where everything else has got rust and patina on it. So it looks like I need to increase the diameter. Doesn't look like it's much though. Uh, this is probably just two thousandths. So I think I'll, yeah, let's, to, to be safe, let's do three thousand or two thousandths increase in uh, helical cut diameter. Okay, let's try this fit. Okay, I think we're there. I don't want to tighten it too much and jam it in. Uh, but it, uh, looking at the microscope image some more, it looked like each uh, thread tip, the, the face of the thread tip uh, got a little wider than the previous one as we approached the, uh, the lead out on, on the lathe cut uh, threads on the, on the piston, um, or the, the, the piston rod. So I think what's happening is when this uh, rod was originally turned on a lathe, basically the, the operator started to pull the tool out and um, uh, we have less developed or, or shallow threads. That seems to be the case. Uh, so it looks like we're basically getting right up onto the uh, end of the thread here. So I'm gonna say we're done with this thread uh, and pull it out. And if anything, uh, Keith will just have a real tight fit. <laughs> All right, let's, um, I guess one last thing to do is to cut the chamfer into the top uh, leading edge of this thread in the nut. So let's set up for that and do that real quick. And then we can just basically run this whole sequence again uh, over and down, uh, probably without uh, monitoring for uh, the second nut. Okay, so we're in the final stretch here. All we have to do is the backside operations on these two castle nuts. So I've got this, uh, this magnet uh, spacer uh, for the chuck here. Make sure you can make sure that, uh, you wanna make sure your magnets are clean so that you don't get uh, errant uh, parallel um, spacing. So let's go ahead and stick this guy on our chuck. Uh, I did have to cut the, um, the tines back so that they fit over my uh, jaws in this chuck. And then uh, that gives us a, uh, a flat to uh, reference our castle nut on. So let's go ahead and tighten this guy down. I think there's enough of a um, engagement on the jaws where I'm not gonna fuss too much about uh, concentricity of the, of the nut and it doesn't really matter in this application anyway. Okay, so we're back with a new camera angle. Uh, I think I'm gonna go to 500 RPM. So I'm gonna hack off the end here first. Get out of the, the bulk of the uh, interrupted cut.
And then we'll start taste, uh, facing off the, uh, the end of the uh, stock here. All right, so our final cut is gonna be uh, 10 thousandths. Let me turn on the spindle. And then we'll move in 10 thousandths. So let's for that uh, surface, constant surface feet, which means the RPM will increase as the tool uh, approaches the center of the, uh, of the stock we're machining. We can go all the way in. So right now it's 900 RPM, uh, 1500 RPM, which is the max I set the, the controller to at the beginning of this operation. And then as we go further out, as the circumference increases to maintain constant surface feet, um, the RPM drops. So if I go further out beyond our part uh, to three inches diameter, uh, this is, uh, at uh, four inches diameter, we're at 175 RPM. So, if I, uh, if I move the tool away from the chuck and I wrap it in, we'll see how fast the spindle can increase. So that's a way to play around with your constant surface feet, just by changing the location of the cutting tip. Anyway, enough of playing. Let's go ahead and chamfer the, uh, the thread on the back side of this nut. Okay, so I got the spindle set at uh, a constant 500 RPM, and I've loaded this, uh, this boring bar into the tool holder. It's sticking out a little farther uh, just for, uh, uh, so the camera can see it. And we're gonna put our final chamfer into this, uh, the back side of this nut for a lead in. Okay. And then on the controller, I'm hitting do one, taper, Minus 45 incremental set. So now we're set up in the taper mode again, or 45 degree cut mode. It's still gonna be noisy. Maybe I'll reduce the uh, spindle down this time. Uh, I already cut the first one and it was pretty loud. Let's go uh, 393 RPM. Again, it's cause the uh, boring bar is sticking out too far so the camera can see. Let's go ahead and try cutting. And we're moving at a 45 degree angle right now. Sounded a little better. And then I'll uh, back back out to the zero point at, the, at a 45 degree. We'll just clean that up a few times. And with that, I think we are done making these nuts. So a nice trick for a lapping table or a welding table or any kind of rotary axis is a uh, potter's wheel. Um, you can adjust the speed very accurately uh, if you're welding a, uh, a round part or you can go really fast, uh, reasonably fast if you're, if you're cutting off uh, material. Uh, so this is just an aluminum platen that's uh, turned uh, very flat actually and then I just stick on these um, uh, adhesive backed 18 inch sanding wheels. And you can get real precise, uh, clean, um, deburring and lapping. It doesn't take off a lot of material, but it's more of a finishing tool. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, a, a potter's wheel at an art supply place is like 500 bucks. And with that, we are uh, finished with our castle nuts, uh, two, two of uh, one of the higher uh, end uh, priced castle nuts, I'm sure, that are out there outside of the military. Uh, but yeah, they, they turned out great. Um, A2 tool steel in the annealed form. Uh, if you uh, stay tuned for the stress analysis video I'm going to do, and we're going to talk about uh, hardened versus annealed and stresses involved in these parts. Uh, the original nut, uh, which I think is just uh, general hot rolled steel, uh, was really soft. These are definitely a lot harder, even annealed. Uh, and Keith Rucker can go ahead and heat treat these any way he wants because he's done A2, uh, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, yeah, so there you go. Here's our nuts, and I will ship these off to Keith so we can get them into the uh, Stoker steam engine for the 576 uh, mainline um, locomotive restoration. All right, uh, thanks for watching, and uh, stay tuned for more episodes. Uh, goodbye.